Chapter 3. Democratic Confederalism This kind of rule or administration can be called a non-state political administration, or a democracy without a state. Democratic decision-making processes must not be confused with the processes known from public administration. States only administrate, while democracies govern. States are founded on power. Democracies are based on collective consensus. Office in the state is determined by decree, even though it may be in part legitimized by elections. Democracies use direct elections. The state uses coercion as legitimate means. Democracies rest on voluntary participation. Democratic confederalism is open towards other political groups and factions. It is flexible, multicultural, anti-monopolistic, and consensus-oriented. Ecology and feminism are central pillars. In the frame of this kind of self-administration, an alternative economy will become necessary, which increases the resources of the society instead of exploiting them, and thus does justice to the manifold needs of the society. A. Participation and the diversity of the political landscape. The contradictory composition of the society necessitates political groups with both vertical and horizontal formations. Central, regional, and local groups need to be balanced in this way. Only they, each for itself, are able to deal with its special concrete situation and develop appropriate solutions for far-reaching social problems. It is a natural right to express one's cultural, ethnic, or national identity with the help of political associations. However, this right needs an ethical and political society. Whether nation-state, republic, or democracy, democratic confederalism is open for compromises concerning state or governmental traditions. It allows for equal coexistence. b. The heritage of the society and the accumulation of historical knowledge. Then again, democratic confederalism rests on the historical experience of the society and its collective heritage. It is not an arbitrary modern political system, but rather accumulates history and experience. It is the offspring of the life of the society. The state continuously orientates itself towards centralism in order to pursue the interests of the power monopolies. Just the opposite is true for confederalism. Not the monopolies, but the society is at the center of political focus. The heterogeneous structure of the society is in contradiction to all forms of centralism. Distinct centralism only results in social eruptions. Within living memory, people have always formed loose groups of clans, tribes, or other communities with federal qualities. In this way, they are able to preserve their internal autonomy. Even the internal government of empires employed diverse methods of self-administration for their different parts, which included religious authorities, tribal councils, kingdoms, and even republics. Hence, it is important to understand that even centralist-seeming empires follow a confederate organizational structure. The centralist model is not an administrative model wanted by the society. Instead, it has its source in the preservation of power of the monopolies. C. Ethics and Political Awareness The classification of the society in categories and terms after a certain pattern is produced artificially by the capitalist monopolies. What counts in a society like that is not what you are, but what you appear to be. The putative alienation of the society from its own existence encourages the withdrawal from active participation, a reaction which is often called disenchantment with politics. However, societies are essentially political and value-oriented. Economic, political, ideological, and military monopolies are constructions which contradict the nature of society by merely striving for the accumulation of surplus. They do not create values, nor can a revolution create a new society. It can only influence the ethical and political web of a society. Anything else is at the discretion of the ethics-based political society. I mentioned already that the capitalist modernity enforces the centralization of the state. The political and military power centers within the society have been deprived of their influence. The nation-state, as a modern substitute of monarchy, left a weakened and defenseless society behind. In this respect, legal order and public peace only imply the class rule of the bourgeoisie. 
power constitutes itself in the central state and becomes one of the fundamental administrative paradigms of modernity. This puts the nation-state in contrast to democracy and republicanism. Our project of democratic modernity is meant as an alternative draft to modernity as we know it. It builds on democratic confederalism as a fundamental political paradigm. Democratic modernity is the roof of an ethics-based political society. As long as we make the mistake to believe that societies need to be homogenous monolithic entities, it will be difficult to understand confederalism. Modernity's history is also a history of four centuries of cultural and physical genocide in the name of an imaginary unitary society. Democratic confederalism, as a sociological category, is the counterpart of this history, and it rests on the will to fight if necessary as well as on ethnic, cultural, and political diversity. The crisis of the financial system is an inherent consequent of the capitalist nation-state. However, all efforts of the neoliberals to change the nation-state have remained unsuccessful. The Middle East provides instructive examples. D. Democratic confederalism and a democratic political system. In contrast to a centralist and bureaucratic understanding of administration and exercise of power, confederalism poses a type of political self-administration where all groups of the society and all cultural identities can express themselves in local meetings, general conventions, and councils. This understanding of democracy opens up the political space to all strata of the society and allows for the formation of different and diverse political groups. In this way, it also advances the political integration of the society as a whole. Politics becomes a part of everyday life. Without politics, the crisis of the state cannot be solved since the crisis is fueled by a lack of representation of the political society. Terms like federalism or self-administration, as they can be found in liberal democracies, need to be conceived anew. Essentially, they should not be conceived as hierarchical levels of the administration of the nation-state, but rather as central tools of social expression and participation. This, in turn, will advance the politicization of the society. We do not need big theories here. What we need is the will to lend expression to the social needs by strengthening the autonomy of social actors structurally and by creating the conditions for the organization of the society as a whole. The creation of an operational level where all kinds of social and political groups, religious communities, or intellectual tendencies can express themselves directly in all local decision-making processes can also be called participative democracy. The stronger the participation, the more powerful is this kind of democracy. While the nation-state is in contrast to democracy and even denies it, democratic confederalism constitutes a continuous democratic process. The social actors, which are each for itself federative units, are the germ cells of participative democracy. They can combine and associate into new groups and confederations according to the situation. Each of the political units involved in participative democracy is essentially democratic. In this way, what we call democracy then is the application of democratic processes of decision-making from the local level to the global level in the framework of a continuous political process. This process will affect the structure of the social web of the society, in contrast to the striving for the homogeneity of the nation-state, a construct that can only be realized by force, thus bringing about the loss of freedom. I have already addressed the point that the local level is the level where the decisions are made. However, the thinking leading to these decisions needs to be in line with global issues. We need to become aware of the fact that even villages and urban neighborhoods require confederate structures. All areas of the society need to be given to self-administration. All levels of it need to be free to participate. E. Democratic confederalism and self-defense. Essentially, the nation-state is a militarily structured entity. Nation-states are eventually the products of all kinds of internal and external warfare. None of the existing nation-states has come into existence all by itself. Invariably, they have a record of wars. This process is not limited to their founding phase, but rather, it builds on the militarization of the entire society. The civil leadership of the state is only an accessory of the military apparatus. Liberal democracies even outdo this by painting their militaristic structures in democratic and liberal colors. However, 
This does not keep them from seeking authoritarian solutions at the high point of a crisis caused by the system itself. Fascist exercise of power is the nature of the nation-state. Fascism is the purest form of the nation-state. This militarization can only be pushed back with the help of self-defense. Societies without any mechanism of self-defense lose their identities, their capability of democratic decision-making, and their political nature. Therefore, the self-defense of a society is not limited to the military dimension alone. It presupposes the preservation of its identity, its own political awareness, and a process of democratization. Only then can we talk about self-defense. Against this background, democratic confederalism can be called a system of self-defense of the society. Only with the help of confederate networks can there be a basis to oppose the global domination of the monopolies and nation-state militarism. Against the network of monopolies, we must build up an equally strong network of social confederacies. This means, in particular, that the social paradigm of confederalism does not involve a military monopoly for the armed forces, which only have the task of ensuring the internal and external security. They are under direct control of the democratic institutions. The society itself must be able to determine their duties. One of their tasks will be the defense of the free will of the society from internal and external interventions. The composition of the military leadership needs to be determined in equal terms, and parts by both the political institutions and the confederate groupings. F. Democratic Confederalism versus Strife for Hegemony In democratic confederalism there is no room for any kind of hegemony striving. This is particularly true in the field of ideology. Hegemony is a principle that is usually followed by the classic type of civilization. Democratic civilizations reject hegemonic powers and ideologies. Any ways of expression which cut across the boundaries of democratic self-administration would any ways of expression which cut across the boundaries of democratic self-administration would carry self-administration and freedom of expression ad absurdum. The collective handling of matters of the society needs understanding respect of dissenting opinions and democratic ways of decision-making. This is in contrast to the understanding of leadership in the capitalist modernity, where arbitrary bureaucratic decisions of nation-state character are diametrically opposed to the democratic confederate leadership in line with ethic foundations. In democratic confederalism, leadership institutions do not need ideological legitimization. Hence, they do not strive for hegemony. G. Democratic Confederate Structures at a Global Scale Although in democratic confederalism the focus is on the local level, organizing confederalism globally is not excluded. To the contrary, we need to put up a platform of national civil societies in terms of a confederate assembly to oppose the United Nations as an association of nation states under the leadership of the superpowers. In this way, we might get better decisions with a view to peace, ecology, justice, and productivity in the world. H. Conclusion Democratic confederalism can be described as a kind of self-administration in contrast to the administration by the nation-state. However, under certain circumstances, peaceful coexistence is possible as long as the nation-state does not interfere with central matters of self-administration. All such interventions would call for the self-defense of the civil society. Democratic confederalism is not at war with any nation-state, but it will not stand idly by at assimilation efforts. Revolutionary overthrow or the foundation of a new state does not create sustainable change. In the long run, freedom and justice can only be accomplished within a democratic confederate dynamic process. Neither total rejection nor complete recognition of the state is useful for the democratic efforts of the civil society. The overcoming of the state, particularly the nation-state, is a long-term process. The state will be overcome when democratic confederalism has proved its problem-solving capacities with a view to social issues. This does not mean, though, that attacks by nation-states have to be accepted. Democratic confederations will sustain self-defense forces at all times. Democratic confederations will not be limited to organize themselves within a single, particular territory. They will become cross-border confederations when the society's concerns so desire. 4. Principles of Democratic Confederalism 1. The right of self-determination of the peoples includes the right to a state of their own. However, the foundation of a state does not increase the freedom of a people. 
the system of the United Nations that is based on nation-states has remained inefficient. Meanwhile, nation-states have become serious obstacles for any social development. Democratic confederalism is the contrasting paradigm of the oppressed people. 2. Democratic confederalism is a non-state social paradigm. It is not controlled by a state. At the same time, democratic confederalism is the cultural organizational blueprint of a democratic nation. 3. Democratic confederalism is based on grassroots participation. Its decision-making processes lie with the communities. Higher levels only serve the coordination and the implementation of the will of the communities that send their delegates to the General Assemblies. For limited space of time, they are both mouthpiece and executive institutions. However, the basic power of decision rests with the local grassroots institutions. 4. In the Middle East, democracy cannot be imposed by the capitalist system and its imperial powers, which only damage democracy. The propagation of grassroots democracy is elementary. It is the only approach that we can cope with diverse ethnical groups, religions, and class differences. It also goes together well with the traditional confederate structure of society. 5. Democratic confederalism in Kurdistan is an anti-nationalist movement as well. It aims at realizing the right of self-defense of the peoples by the advancement of democracy in all parts of Kurdistan without questioning the existing political borders. Its goal is not the foundation of a Kurdish nation-state. The movement intends to establish federal structures in Iran, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq that are open for all Kurds and at the same time form an umbrella confederation for all four parts of Kurdistan. 5. Problems of the peoples in the Middle East and possible ways to a solution. The national question is not a phantasm of the capitalist modernity. Nevertheless, it was the capitalist modernity which imposed the national question on the society. The nation replaced the religious community. However, the transition to a national society needs to be the overcoming of the capitalist modernity if the nation is not to remain the disguise of repressive monopolies. As negative as is the overemphasis of the national category in the Middle East, as severe would be the consequences of neglecting the collective national aspect. Hence, the method in handling the issue should not be ideological but scientific, and not nation-statist but based on the concept of democratic nation and democratic communalism. The contents of such an approach are the fundamental elements of democratic modernity. Over the past two centuries, nationalism and tendency for nation-states have been fueled in the societies of the Middle East. The national issues have not been solved, but rather have been aggravated in all areas of the society. Instead of cultivating productive competition, the capital enforces internal and external wars in the name of the nation-state. The theory of communalism would be an alternative to capitalism. In the framework of democratic nations, which do not strive for power monopolies, it may lead to peace in a region which has only been the field of gory wars and genocides. In this context, we can speak of four majority nations, Arabs, Persians, Turks, and Kurds. I do not wish to divide nations into majority or minority, as I do not find this to be appropriate. But due to demographic considerations, I shall speak of majority nations. In the same context, we may also use the term minority nations. 1. There are more than 20 Arab nation-states which divide the Arab community and damage their societies by wars. This is one of the main factors responsible for the alienation of cultural values and the apparent hopelessness of the Arab national question. These nation-states have not even been able to form a cross-national economic community. They are the main reason of the problematic situation of the Arab nation. A religiously motivated tribal nationalism, together with a sexist patriarchal society, pervades all areas of the society, resulting in a distinct conservatism and slavish obedience. Nobody believes that the Arabs will be able to find an Arab national solution to their internal and cross-national problems. However, democratization and a communalist approach might provide such a solution. Their weakness towards Israel, which the Arab nation-states regard as a competitor, is not only the result of international support by the hegemonic powers. Rather, it is the result of a strong internal democratic and communal institutions within Israel. Over the last century, 
the society of the Arab nation has been weakened by radical nationalism and Islamism. Yet, if they are able to unite under communal socialism which they are not a stranger to with that of the understanding of a democratic nation, then they may be able to find themselves a secure, long-term solution. 2. The Turks and Turkmen form another influential nation. They share a similar understanding of power and ideology with the Arabs. They are strict nation statists and have a profound religious and racial nationalism engraved in them. From a sociological point of view, the Turks and Turkmen's are quite different. The relations between Turkmen and Turkish aristocracy resemble the tense relations between Bedouins and Arab aristocracy. They form a stratum whose interests are compatible with democracy and communalism. The national problems are quite complex. The power strive of the nation-state, distinct nationalism and a sexist patriarchal society prevail, and create a very conservative society. The family is regarded as the smallest cell of the state. Both individuals and institutions have taken in these aspects. Turkish and Turkmen communities struggle for power. Other ethnic groups are subjected to a distinct policy of subjugation. The centralist power structures of the Turkish nation-state and the rigid official ideology have prevented a solution to the Kurdish question until today. The society is made to believe that there is no alternative to the state. There is no balance between the individual. Obedience is regarded as the greatest virtue. In contrast to this, the theory of democratic modernity offers an adequate approach to all national communities in Turkey to solve their national problems. A community-based project of a democratic Turkish confederation would both strengthen its internal unity and create the conditions for a peaceful coexistence with the neighbors that it lives with. Borders have lost its former meaning when it comes to social unity. In spite of geographic boundaries, today's modern communication tools allow for a virtual unity between individuals and communities wherever they are. A democratic confederation of the Turkish national communities could be a contribution to world peace and the system of democratic modernity. 3. The Kurdish national society is very complex. Worldwide, the Kurds are the biggest nation without a state of their own. They have been settling in their present settlement areas since the Neolithic. Agriculture and stock breeding, as well as their readiness to defend themselves using the geographic advantages of their mountainous homeland, helped the Kurds to survive as a native people. The Kurdish national question rises from the fact that they have been denied their right to nationhood. Others tried to assimilate them, annihilate them, and in the end flatly denied their existence. Not having a state of their own has advantages and disadvantages. The excrescences of state-based civilizations have only been taken in to a limited extent. This can be a benefit in the realization of alternative social concepts beyond the capitalist modernity. Their settlement area is divided by the national borders of four countries and lies in a geostrategically important region, thus providing the Kurds a strategic advantage. The Kurds do not have the chance to form a national society through the use of state power. Although there is a Kurdish political entity today in Iraqi Kurdistan, it is not a nation-state, but rather a parastatal entity. Kurdistan had also been home to Armenian and Aramaic minorities before these fell victims to genocides. There are also smaller groups of Arabs and Turks. Even today there are many different religions and faiths living side by side there. There are also rudiments of a clan and tribal culture, while there is almost no presence of urban culture there. All these properties are a blessing for new democratic political formations. Communal cooperatives in farming but also in the water economy and the energy sector offer themselves as ideal ways of production. The situation is also favorable for the development of an ethical political society. Even the patriarchal ideology is less deeply rooted here than in the neighboring societies. This is beneficial for the establishment of a democratic society where women's freedom and equality are to form one of the main pillars. It also offers the conditions for the creation of a democratic environment friendly nation in line with the paradigm of democratic modernity. The construction of a democratic nation based on multinational identities is the ideal solution when faced with the dead end street nation state. The emerging entity could become a blueprint for the entire Middle East then expand dynamically into neighboring countries.
convincing the neighboring nations of this model shall change the fate of the Middle East and shall reinforce the chance of democratic modernity to create an alternative. In this sense, therefore, the freedom of the Kurds and the democratization of their society would be synonymous with the freedom of the whole region and its societies. 4. The reasons for today's problems of the Persian or Iranian nation can be found in the interventions of historical civilizations and the capitalist modernity. Although their original identity was a result of Zoroastrian and Mithraic tradition, these have been annulled by a derivative of Islam. Manichaeism that emerged as the synthesis of Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism with Greek philosophy was not able to prevail against the ideology of their official civilization. Indeed, it went no further than to nurture the tradition of rebellion. It has hence converted the Islamic tradition into Shia denomination, and adopted it to be the latest civilizational ideology. Presently, there are efforts made to modernize itself by passing the elements of capitalist modernity through its Shia filter. The Iranian society is multi-ethnic and multi-religious and blessed with a rich culture. All national and religious identities of the Middle East can be found there. This diversity is in strong contrast to the hegemonic claim of the theocracy, which cultivates a subtle religious nationalism and the ruling class does not shrink back from anti-modernist propaganda whenever it serves their interests. Revolutionary and democratic tendencies have been integrated by the traditional civilization. A despotic regime skillfully governs the country. The negative effects of American and European sanctions are not negligible here. Despite strong centralist efforts in Iran, from the grassroots already some kind of federalism exists. When elements of democratic civilization and federalist elements including Azeris, Kurds, Baluchis, Arabs, and Turkmens intersect, the project of a democratic confederation of Iran can emerge and become attractive. Women's movement and communal traditions will play a special role here. 5. The Armenian national question contains one of the greatest tragedies that the progress of the capitalist modernity has brought about in the Middle East. The Armenians are a very old people. They shared much of their settlement area with the Kurds. While the Kurds lived primarily on agriculture and animal husbandry, the Armenians engaged in arts and crafts. Just like the Kurds, the Armenians cultivated a tradition of self-defense. Apart from some short episodes, the Armenians never successfully founded a state. They rely on Christian culture, which gives them their identity and their faith in salvation. Because of their religion, they often suffered repression at the hands of the Muslim majority. Hence, the emerging nationalism bore fruit with the Armenian bourgeoisie. Soon there are differences within the Turkish nationalists eventually ending in the genocide of the Armenians by the Turks. Apart from the Jews, the Armenians are the second largest people which live primarily in the diaspora. The foundation of an Armenian state in the west of Azerbaijan, however, did not solve the Armenian national question. The consequences of the genocide can hardly be put into words. The search for the lost country defines their national psyche and is at the heart of the Armenian question. The issue is aggravated by the fact that these areas have been settled by other people since then. Any concepts based on a nation-state cannot offer a solution. There is neither a homogeneous population structure there, nor any clear borders as is required by the capitalist modernity. The thinking of their opponents may be fascist. However, it is not enough to only bring the genocide to one's mind. Confederate structures could be an alternative for the Armenians. The foundation of a democratic Armenian nation in line with the paradigm of the democratic modernity, promises the Armenians an opportunity to reinvent themselves. It could enable them to return to their place in the cultural plurality of the Middle East. In the event that they renew themselves under the Armenian democratic nation, not only shall they continue to play their historical role within the Middle East culture, but they shall also find the right path to liberation. 6. In modern times, the Christian Aramaeans, Assyrians, also suffered the fate of the Armenians. They too are one of the oldest people in the Middle East. They shared a settlement area with the Kurds, but also with other people. Like the Armenians, they suffered from oppression by the Muslim majority, paving the way for European-style nationalism among the Aramean bourgeoisie. Eventually, the Arameans too fell victims to genocide at the hands of the Turks under the leadership of the fascist Committee of Unity and Progress. 
the collaborationist Kurds lent a helping hand in this genocide. The question of an Aramean national society has its roots in the civilization, but has also developed further with Christianity and ideologies of modernity. For a solution, there is a need for a radical transformation of the Arameans. Their real salvation may be to break away from the mentality of classical civilization and capitalist modernity and instead embrace democratic civilization and renew their rich cultural memory as an element of democratic modernity in order to reconstruct themselves as the Aramean democratic nation. 7. The history of the Jewish people also gives expression to the overall problematic cultural history of the Middle East. The search for the backdrop of expulsion pogroms and genocide amounts to balancing the accounts of the civilizations. The Jewish community has taken up the influences of the old Sumerian and Egyptian cultures, as well as those of the regional tribal cultures. It has contributed a lot to the culture of the Middle East. Like the Aramaeans, they fell victims to extreme developments of modernity. Against this background, intellectuals of Jewish descent developed a complex point of view towards these issues. However, this is by far not enough. For a solution of the problems as they exist today, a renewed appropriation of the history of the Middle East is needed on a democratic basis. The Israeli nation-state is at war since its foundation. The slogan is, an eye for an eye. Fire cannot be fought by fire, though. Even if Israel enjoys relative security thanks to its international support, this is not a sustainable solution. Nothing will be permanently safe as long as the capitalist modernity has not been overcome. The Palestine conflict makes it clear that the nation-state paradigm is not helpful for a solution. There has been much bloodshed. What remains is the difficult legacy of seemingly irresolvable problems. The Israel-Palestine example shows the complete failure of the capitalist modernity and the nation-state. The Jews belong to the culture-bearers of the Middle East. Denial of their right to existence is an attack on the Middle East as such. Their transformation into a democratic nation, just as for Armenians and Arameans, would make their participation in a democratic confederation of the Middle East easier. The project of an East Again democratic confederation would be a positive start. Strict and exclusive national and religious identities may evolve into flexible and open identities under this project. Israel may also evolve into a more acceptable and open democratic nation. Undoubtedly, though, its neighbors must also go through such a transformation. Tensions and armed conflicts in the Middle East make a transformation of the paradigm of modernity seem inevitable. Without it, a solution of difficult social problems and national questions is impossible. Democratic modernity offers an alternative to the system that is unable to resolve problems. 8. The annihilation of Hellenic culture in Anatolia is a loss that cannot be compensated. The ethnic cleansing arranged by the Turkish and Greek nation-states in the first quarter of the last century has left its mark. No state has the right to drive people from their ancestral cultural religion. Nevertheless, the nation-states showed their inhuman approach towards such issues again and again. The attacks on the Hellenic, Jewish, Aramean, and Armenian cultures were stepped up, while Islam spread throughout the Middle East. This, in turn, contributed to the decline of the Middle Eastern civilization. The Islamic culture has never been able to fill the emerging void. In the 19th century, when the capitalist modernity advanced into the Middle East, it found a cultural desert created by self-inflicted cultural erosion. Cultural diversity also strengthens the defense mechanisms of a society. Monocultures are less robust. Hence, the conquest of the Middle East has not been difficult the projects of a homogeneous nation as propagated by the nation-states furthered their cultural decline. 9. The Caucasian ethnic groups also have social problems which are not insignificant. Again and again, they have migrated into the Middle East and stimulated its cultures. They have unquestionably contributed to its cultural wealth. The arrival of modernity almost made these minority cultures disappear. They, too, would find their adequate place in a confederate structure. Finally, let me state again that the fundamental problems of the Middle East are deeply rooted in the class civilization. They have tightened with the global crisis of the capitalist modernity. 
This modernity and its claims to dominance cannot offer any solutions, not to mention a long-term perspective for the Middle East region. The future is democratic confederalism.